recording. Share my screen. Close that. Hey, welcome to another data mining day. Today, um, start going over the uh, midterm. Your midterm is all graded, posted in Sakai. If you haven't seen it yet, you can go there, check out your grade. And there are some uh, notes about uh, why your grade is what it is. If uh, we're going to go over the exam today, certainly if you feel like I misgraded something for any reason, uh, uh, whether that's just adding up the, the points incorrectly or you think that I graded a problem incorrectly, then uh, feel free to let me know and I'll take a look at it and uh, fix any mistakes that I have made. Before we get into the content of the midterm, this uh, midterm 2.pdf file. We'll go over it in a second. Has the answer key to the midterm. Uh, we'll take a look at that and some commonly missed uh, problems here in a second. Uh, but just quick uh, grade distribution visualization. So this was our first midterm grade distribution, and the second one in comparison uh, for both midterms. Uh, uh, highly or half the class-ish uh, getting into the, the A range and then spread over the rest of the class, uh, the rest of the, uh, the grade range. Uh, I haven't decided yet about, so I will have some sort of uh, makeup uh, assignment for, for people who miss more points than you wanted to on the second midterm and, um, and want to get some of those points back. Uh, I'll have, by the end of this weekend, I'll have made a decision on exactly what that is, but I'm <coughs> torn at this point between uh, basically letting you do another midterm or uh, doing uh, in-person uh, oral exam sort of thing. Um, uh, but there'll be some, if, if for whatever reason your grade is not what you hoped it to be, there'll be there will be some opportunity to make up uh, some of those points. The overall grade distribution in the class uh, looks like this. And I would just uh, uh, maybe caution you if you're looking at this about like what you think your uh, final grade is, because again, in this class, we'll have one more midterm and a final exam. And um, uh, the projects, the, right now these grades I think are just a little bit inflated because the projects, um, which will eventually be 25% of your final grade, is currently taking up 50% of your grade just because we haven't had those other exams yet. And um, everybody's scores on the projects are uh, tend to be better than the scores on the exams. So that's slightly inflating things. Um, so the exam scores are probably more closely reflective of uh, final grade scores in the class. Um, oops. So uh, answer key for the uh, uh, for the midterm. I just want to highlight a couple. We'll start with the, the true and the false here. Uh, true, false, open. Highlight some of the things that um, people um, commonly missed questions here. Uh, the first one, number two right here. So asking about the relationship between the, the VC dimension, if that implies that a hypothesis class is a subset of another hypothesis class. The reverse of this statement, that the subset implying the VC dimension, that would be a true statement. Uh, but the VC dimension implying the subset is definitely not a true statement. And um, I think there are four or five people who missed this problem. Uh, but this is definitely something that we uh, specifically even talked about in class and worked through in class. Uh, let's see, number five uh, and six, I think we're both really easy just to, there are a lot of um, incorrect answers on these two. And I think uh, my guess is that a lot of people just missed exactly the directions or misreading something about what's uh, being asked here. On number five, we have two hypothesis classes, the perceptron hypothesis class, and this H sub V is with the decision stump feature map. Um, 
And the, the whole point of the decision stump feature map is that it is going to drastically reduce our VC dimension. And so if we're uh, drastically reducing our VC dimension, then we're getting the better generalization bound according to VC theory. And uh, so it should be G sub V has the better generalization bound than G rather than the other than what's stated. Um, for number six right here, it's uh, so here's our approximation error. This is the uh, the best possible uh, error that we could get on a hypothesis if we had uh, an infinite amount of training data right here. And uh, uh, applying the random uh, feature embedding, again, that's going to uh, reduce the amount of uh, features we have. The model with the random feature embedding is a subset of the original model. And uh, so that uh, uh, does not decrease the approximation error, it, it increases the approximation error. Um, uh, because the you know, we're selecting a subset model. So that can only increase the approximation error. Number seven is another one that um, uh, people missed a lot on. I guess a lot of these ones with the subset relationship of hypothesis classes. Here, this H axis is a subset of H axis two. Every function inside of this one down here is contained inside of this one up here. And uh, because we have that subset relationship, we can say, in fact, that this uh, relationship must be true about the, the in sample error. And then uh, number eight down here too about the relationship between uh so e out minus e test that's the the key thing about number eight down here it's asking about the difference between your uh true error and your uh, test set error and the only thing that affects this difference right here the only thing that affects e out minus e test is the number of sample points that you have in your test set um, so the, the compli how complicated your hypothesis class makes no difference at all. It's just the number of sample points that you have in your test sets. It's pretty fast through those problems. Any questions about any of those or any other true and false open questions? Okay. Uh, Number two here, uh, people missed a lot more points on this than I was hoping they would miss. Um, the, so if f is our true label function, then it must be the case that uh, en sub f is equal to zero. We had, there were three possible ways of having our, um, the, the error of our, um, of our machine learning algorithm be large. And one of those ways uh, was if there was noise inherent in the problem. And somehow you had to say that, um, I don't know if you said anything about noise and didn't say anything incorrect, then, then you got full credit on this problem. Um, a lot of people um, talked about overfitting here and, um, uh, everybody who used the word overfitting used it incorrectly, that the true label function here, this is not dependent on the data in any way, this F function right here, not dependent on the data. And so overfitting is not a thing that's applicable to this. Overfitting is only applicable to a hypothesis that you have actually trained. And, um, and this is not something that you have trained. So if you uh, use the word overfitting anywhere in your answer, then I probably took away full credit from that because uh, it's a misunderstanding of what it means to be overfitting. Any questions about problem number two? Uh, so if, if you have a specific thing about why you think your thing is why your grade is the way it is, then yeah, we'll talk about it after class. Um, yeah, for a lot of the, the, the problems, I wrote notes saying why it's right or wrong. Um, but if, it, if I thought it directly matched one of these things, then um, I, I probably didn't say like why exactly I took a point off. Um, number three. 
Uh, most people got full credit on, on this problem. Uh, uh, the truncated hinge loss is one example. Other people gave other uh, uh, sigmoid-ish examples or various other examples of things that are uh, non-convex and surrogate. Uh, so most people did well on that problem. Uh, question is what makes something a loss function? And the answer is it uh, becomes a loss function when you are using it to evaluate or to train your machine learning model. But yes, any loss, any function uh, could in principle be a loss function. Um, problem number four, the, uh, the VC dimension here on this problem is two, and um, uh, everybody who said that got, got full credit uh, with, with your explanations. Uh, but general, in general, when uh, all the various proofs of a VC dimension, what they look like is finding some data set that can be shattered at some particular size, and that provides the lower bound, and then uh, somehow showing that a larger data set uh, cannot be shattered, and that provides an upper bound. And those two things together imply the inequality. Um, if you didn't have these two exact steps down here, and you, yeah, anybody who had VC dimension equals two got full credit. Um, <coughs> number five down here, uh, there was a lot of room for missing points on problem number five. So here are the answers, no. A lot of people said no, um, which is good. Um, and so here we can't directly measure the generalization error. Well, we can never measure that, uh, but we can estimate it with uh, the EN minus E test. We're given both the EN values and the E test values. And uh, we know that because the E test is approximately equal to E out. That was the whole purpose of having our uh, our test set is that it can help us approximate our um, our out of sample error. And the estimated generalization error is large relative to the in sample error here. So I have these I provided those specific numbers um, so that it would look like they're large. Um, if you were just randomly guessing on your problem, then you would have a 50% error. The E test would be 0.5. Uh, so this is about as large as it can be, and this is about as small as it can be. Uh, so the gap between those two things, about as large as the gap can be. Um, and so therefore, our goal should be to uh, reduce the VC dimension to improve uh, performance. Um, if, if, if you said that your goal is to reduce the VC dimension, but you didn't per, like say why in this particular case you want to reduce the VC dimension, uh, then you lost half of the points that somehow you needed to mention that the, um, the, the generalization error up here is relatively large compared to the in sample error. And so that implies that you want to reduce the generalization error. It is not always the case that you want to reduce the generalization error. If our uh, EN value and E test values were the same, then we would not want to be reducing our generalization error. Our generalization error would al already be zero. And so we would want to increase the model capacity in order to reduce the uh, in sample error. Um, a lot of people stated that changing uh, the number of dimensions will have no effect, no effect on the E test on the uh, test set error, and that is an incorrect statement. What is a correct statement is, so related to the uh, true false questions up here, that changing, the only thing that changes E out minus E test, how good of an approximation E test is to E out, the only thing that affects this is the number of sample points in our, uh, test set, but uh, if we changed our number of data points, uh, then the E test is very likely to change, but the E out will change accordingly. Um, so uh, in general, actually adding more data points is going to uh, give you more information to work with. And so all the, all the various errors, um, E in, uh, well, E in, in particular will go down. And then uh, E test is based off of EN and the generalization error. So E test may go down as well.
Um, yeah, so uh, changing D has no effect on E test minus E out, but it does have an effect on E test just by itself. And then uh, last comment here, uh, I didn't deduct any points for uh, this last one here. Um, but uh, in general, when people are talking about the performance of an algorithm, they're, uh, especially in this case where I've already ran the algorithm, um, if I've already run something, then it doesn't make sense to try to make it go faster. Um, so uh, the fact that D is going to be increasing, um, I don't know, the runtime is not like what people talk about when they talk about the performance. Uh, in general, the performance of an algorithm refers to the quality of the solution uh, that you get out of that algorithm uh, foremost. So it refers to the E out, the generalization error in the context of machine learning, uh, which is affected by the E in and the generalization here, error here. Uh, but it's really this out of sample error that uh, the word performance is uh, like a surrogate for. Um, Yeah, and that, so that's uh, not just true in the, in the context of this class, but that's true in the context of like real life and everything. That it's trivial for me to have create an algorithm that runs instantly on this problem uh, just by outputting zero for every possible answer. Um, but it's not a good algorithm. It has low performance, even though it runs fast. A lot of people uh, didn't discuss VC theory or generalization error at all in your answers to this problem. And uh, if that was the case, then uh, then you didn't get any credit on the problem. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, if you say that adding dimension increases the generalization error, but did not state why that is bad for this problem. So here, um, it is a true statement that adding more dimensions is likely to increase our generalization error. VC, VC theory predicts that it will increase your generalization error. Uh, and in this case, that's a bad thing because our generalization error is already large right here. Uh, what we want to do on this problem is reduce our generalization error because this gap between EN and E test is very large. And uh, uh, and so I would, if my if first suggestion, my first thought would be to do something that is going to reduce the number of dimensions, like uh, the random features feature map. Um, if, and that's, but that's only the case for this particular problem because of these numbers that I gave right here. If I had given different numbers, like the EN and the E test here were both equal to 0 0.05, then in that case, the generalization error is basically zero. And so there's no need to decrease it. It'd be more important to decrease the E in over here and adding more features would be a good potential way of decreasing the in sample error. Um, so all the, all the choices that you make when you're doing one of these learning problems, they all have an effect on both your in sample error and the generalization error. And depending on the particular context that you're in is you wanna do one or the other. Uh, so right here, we're in the overfitting regime. So we need to move to the left, uh, move uh, on our complexity graph. We need a less complex model. But if we were in the underfitting regime where these two numbers were basically equal, then we'd need to move to the right, make a more complex model. So I was just wondering in this case, is it okay for us to say that like it was overfitting since it's on the right side of the uh, if you specifically said that this model was overfitting, then that um, uh, would probably be uh, full credit not having this thing right here apply, um, but I'd have to see exactly what you wrote. Uh, Okay, problem number six uh, about the optimization algorithms to choose. Um, the biggest error that happened on this problem was there were maybe four or five students who didn't pick an optimization algorithm. So didn't pick something like 
SGD or gradient descent or second order gradient descent and instead picked a, um, a feature map. If you uh, did feature maps instead of optimization algorithms, then you uh, didn't get credit for the problem. And then, um, uh, so here the, the, the right choice, the best choice was stochastic gradient descent because um, the, our, our data set relatively large, so we're likely to be computationally limited rather than statistically limited. And in this situation, you want to optimize, you want to an optimization algorithm that has the fastest time to the excess error rather than the algorithm with the fastest time to the accuracy row. Uh, so that was the key thing about the Leon uh, Bateau paper uh, is this table right here. Uh, these uh, last two rows, the time to accuracy row. This one right here is what matters if you are trying to make row that, that accuracy go down to zero. But if you're in the large scale system, the computationally limiting system, then you want this fourth row here. You don't need your accuracy to go all the way down to zero. You just have uh, go down to um, what the excess error rate is. And SGD is the fastest for getting down to the excess error rate. Um, but gradient descent or stochastic or second order gradient descent is fastest for making your time to accuracy row go to zero. Um, if you said something about uh, a couple of people chose second order stochastic gradient descent, making the specific claim that you're not computationally limited. And uh, if you said that um, and argued that you're trying to make your optimization error row go to zero, then uh, you got full credit on the problem as well. A lot of people said things that were, this seemed like the sort of thing that they were trying to say, but um, using uh, 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 very technically incorrect language to do that. Um, so ex for example, common things are that the runtime per iteration of stochastic gradient descent does not depend on n. And if that's all you say, then um, like that, that doesn't matter, that that is a true statement that this first row of the table, the time per iteration for stochastic gradient descent does not depend on n, but that's, we don't care about the time per iteration because that doesn't factor in the number of iterations that we need. Um, so it's really this third or this fourth row that we actually need. Um, yeah, a lot of people miss points on this problem. And if you feel like I didn't understand what you were saying, then I would be happy to uh, take a look with you uh, at some point to uh, um, uh, try to get you more credit. Um, but any questions on this? Okay, the last one. Uh, so yeah, working at a car manufacturer, the important things here are the size of our dimensions and the uh, number of uh, data points that we have here. This is another example where we're going to be overfitting because our model is too complicated. A support vector machine is a linear model. The optimization algorithm here doesn't make any difference at all. And uh, we want to uh, decrease the uh, decrease the VC dimension so that we get the the better um, uh, the better training error. I'm sorry, the better generalization error, which will lead to the better out of sample error. Um, again, if you didn't tell me why you wanted to decrease the generalization error on this particular problem, but you wrote it in a way that made it seem like you always want to decrease the generalization error for every possible problem, uh, then you lost half credit on the problem. But if the, like the D was and the N values were reversed, then it'd be the opposite thing that you'd want to be doing. You'd be wanting to uh, increase the model capacity rather than decrease it. Any questions about anything on the midterm? Okay. The uh, yeah, again, I haven't fully decided um, 
about the possibility of uh, making up points on the midterm. There will be some option and I'll have an announcement for that on Monday's class about how uh, people who didn't get as many points as they wanted on the midterm can, uh, can make up some of those points. Um, but this material here from this, where did it go? From this midterm is, uh, all, all the stuff on the next midterm is going to be dependent on this midterm material, so you'll definitely need to know it for that. And again, for the um, for the oral exam, that uh, these are uh, good sorts of questions for for the oral exam. Um, okay, today we have a. New topic for us to move on to. We're going to be talking about something called transfer learning. And this uh, has a, a new uh, handout notes for us in the, the 07 folder, transfer learning, this notes.pdf. And this is what the, the notes file looks like. The, um, uh, the idea of transfer learning, uh, we'll see here in a second. Uh, we're going to or, um, but yeah, so the idea of this notes packet is that you have there's going to be a, a programming assignment uh, related to transfer learning that you're going to have to do, and there is a uh, famous machine learning library called PyTorch, which we'll be using to do this. The uh, uh, documentation you'll be following along the documentation to implement an actual transfer learning system, and so this URL right here takes you to uh, this web page over here and uh, has a bunch of uh, code to follow along with. Um, but the, the basic idea is that we're, you're gonna have an image data set and there's two classes of images, uh, ants and bees, and you're gonna be creating a machine learning system in order to uh, uh, determine whether the input image was an ant or a bee. This, uh, uh, the PyTorch documentation here doesn't directly reference any of the uh, sort of VC dimension stuff, all the theoretical stuff we're, uh, that we've been talking about. And so the main purpose of our discussion today and these notes is to uh, tie exactly in together what uh, the, uh, how the theory stuff that we've been talking about ties into this transfer learning stuff and um, uh, prepare you to, to walk through those notes. What we're not going to talk about, uh, we're not going to talk about how any of the PyTorch library works in class. My expectation is that you'll be able to work through the documentation and figure that uh, out for yourself. If this first uh, tutorial that I'm, I'm linking to you, it feels too complicated to jump straight into, that's okay. There's this introduction to PyTorch set of tutorials over here. And uh, this tensors one is the first one to start with and work through that. And uh, it just shows you just the, the syntax for working with PyTorch. Um, so yeah, I recommend working with these ones over here and then going to the transfer learning. Um, what you'll have to actually submit for this assignment is your final code that you get after working through this tutorial. And then at uh, the end over here, you'll have a, um, uh, a set of uh, predictions like this. It'll be different uh, images that are getting uh, predicted and you'll uh, submit that image to, uh, to Sakai as well. Any questions at a high level before we uh, get down into the details? Uh, just so like, what you mentioned in that classified these images, um, is there like a specific specified like classification or error rate that we're supposed to get to? Guess the question is, is there a target error rate that you're supposed to get to? Um, the, the error rate that they show in the tutorial that they get to is 94%. Uh, I got to um, a little bit less than 94, like 93. And if you're, uh, you should definitely be able to get above 90%. Um, uh, but I'm not gonna be like actually grading, uh, grading that part. But um, yeah, if your code looks reasonable, then you'll, you'll get credit on the assignment.
Okay, um, so I want to start by just taking a look at the, the data set itself. Um, so this bees versus ants data set, there's two classes. There's only about 400 images inside of the data set. And so um, very, very small data sets. We should be very concerned about overfitting on this data set. And we're even making it smaller by uh, splitting the data set into a train and a test split. So the training only has 245 images inside of it. Um, one of the things that uh, you'll recall from our discussion about the, the test set is if we were using Huffing's inequality to bound like the, the difference between e-test, E test minus E out will have a very poor bound with only 153 images. And um, so, yeah, I was saying that they're uh, in the tutorial, they got a 94% accuracy, so that's a 6% error rate. Um, how accurate that actually is uh, real world things, I would say that's like plus or minus 5%. Um, so still pretty big bound on like E test minus E out uh, because there's so few images right here. On our, uh, and, uh, and then on our training set, only 245 um, images to train with. So whatever, whatever we end up choosing, whatever model you end up like working with, you need a very low BC dimension in order to generalize here. And using that uh, rule of thumb from the textbook, uh, we would expect uh, uh, that you need about 10 data points per VC dimension. So that's like, uh, like about 24 is what the, the VC dimension can be. Because that's a very, very small, um, VC dimension, the, the, the model that we're going to be able to work with here, not going to have a lot of capacity. Um, let's take a look at what these images actually look like here. Um, oops. So here's an, one of the examples of a bee over here. And uh, so not only is there like this image of the, the bee inside of it, um, but there's like this extra stuff that's been added around it that the model will have to somehow be able to deal with. Um, this one's like a pretty reasonable image of a bee, I think. Um, but you'll notice that like the, the dimensions of these images are different. That's something else that our model will have to be able to take into account. Here, the B is like very, very zoomed in on, on this B here. And uh, this Bs are, are far away. So that's more things that our model has to be able to deal with. Here's an ant, very zoomed out, uh, medium zoom. And now just a really small picture over here with lots of other um, artifacts in. So all things that our model will have to deal with. And then here is, uh, uh, this is an actual image in your training set right here. And uh, anybody wanna guess, is it a bee or an ant? Like you probably figured out the other ones. Yeah, so this one is a bee. Um, actually, sorry, no, I'm incorrect. This one is an ant. I can tell up here it says ant. Um, uh, but so there is a bunch of like label noise in these uh, images that um, this is one of your training images and it is just a really bad image to work with, but it's, it's what our data set has. Um, so let's see, I skipped over this a little bit talking about the, uh, the, the image data is, or image data in general is usually very noisy. So some of this noise is uh, like non-statistical noise. So like these images are all different sizes, different resolutions. Uh, the size of the bug is different in each image and uh, they have different effects applied to them. None of these effects right here. These, uh, people will informally call these things like noise in, uh, in, our, in our data sets, uh, but these don't relate 
to the like the statistical technical definition of noise. Noise from the textbook. Another way of saying that is that they don't affect our um, E out of F, the Bayes error. So again, this is the error of the best possible like function that we could possibly learn here. Um, that for all those images that had different sizes or that had the borders put around them, you were still able to figure out like what the uh, what the actual image was. And so this is not affecting uh, uh, this E out right here at all. Uh, but the other type of uh, noise, that statistical noise, so like the scrape from the web, there's errors. That's like the, the image that we just, there's not actually a picture there. It's just um, uh, image does not exist. All of these things actually do affect do affect the Bayes error. And as you're reading through the uh, uh, through the tutorial with the code, uh, the the author talks about these different problems and some of the different uh, PyTorch solutions that they they uh, uh, implement related to some of these problems. And it's just good for you to keep in mind when they're talking about noise or when other links that you're looking at are talking about noise. There's these two different types of noise and um, uh, that this is the really bad kind of noise down here, uh, but this one, oh, there's lots of things that we can do about these ones up here. So then the fact that these are scraped from the web, so there's errors. Um, uh, humans are the people who annotated this. Us humans, we are uh, have limited, pathetic human brains. And so um, people have estimated like for images, what is the error rate that humans make when labeling? And 5% is like the, the standard uh, error rate that people get. Um, people, as they're labeling ant or bees, they'll fall asleep or have um, uh, just stop paying attention. Um, but there's also uh, some images, so not in this data set, but some uh, images in other data sets can legitimately have uh, multiple labels, and it's not even clear like what the right label uh, should be. And we'll take a look at that examples of this here in a second. Uh, any questions on the difference between those two types of noise? No. Can you not think about the uh, the particular problem that you're working on, it will either have an ant or a bee in it. There is no like none category. Yeah, so then how like that, so that's just means that it's like uh, 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 this, this, this is noise. Like the fact that this is labeled ant is totally arbitrary. Um, um, and uh, so that's an example of the kind of noise that there's nothing that you can do about that except getting a better data distribution. Uh, even if we, even if our problem were to be like adding this third class of doesn't contain anything, neither ant nor b, the actual label associated with this would still be ant because some puny human uh, clicks the ant button uh, when they were labeling this. And so that's just what the data is. And uh, by the time it gets to you, there's not much you can do about it. So besides, so this is the data set that you'll be working with directly, this bees versus ant data set. There's another very famous image data set called ImageNet. And uh, it's a much larger data set. So 1,000 classes, uh, 1.2 million images, and the test set size here is actually big enough that like uh, eout is very, very close to, uh, oops, not en right there, but e test. 
Um, and so usually when people are reporting like accuracies on ImageNet, they'll go out to uh, three decimal places. And, uh, and we pretty much believe that that's the, the level of accuracy that they're uh, legitimately uh, able to measure. Uh, because this data set is larger, it's more susceptible to uh, all of these errors. And so I'm going to take us to visit this link down here and see how um, some of these images like legitimately do have multiple labels associated with them. And here we go. Let's zoom in here. So this is a picture of a um, uh, the different types of mistakes that uh, different uh, algorithms that people have trained are, are making. And uh, here's an example of uh, like one of those mistakes that the correct label for this image uh, was dough, but the model is predicting bagel. And this is inside of the oven, like as this dough is in the process of being cooked. So like at what point should we start making this label be dough versus bagel? Like that seems like a pretty reasonable prediction for me, but the, the label here is just dough. Um, so there's nothing that we can do about that. Um, down here, um, so there's, there we go multiple things inside of this image uh, right here that there's uh, dogs, a border collie and a patio inside of it. Um, like which one of those two things should we be uh, predicting? Right here, this, uh, the ground truth is a Chesapeake Bay retriever. But if our model predicted like a Labrador retriever, that's gonna be uh, for all the zero one loss errors, everything that we've been talking about in class, uh, that would be just as bad as predicting that this is a house. Um, there's no like taking into account that these uh, classes have some sort of relationships with each other. Um, let's see. I thought there were a few more better ones. Here's just uh, some sample of the images from the ImageNet data sets uh, that. Uh, pictures of various random objects, um, all sorts of different things and all sorts of different labels. Um, yeah, so some images can legitimately have multiple labels and it was just like arbitrarily again, human decision about what it got picked. So for any image learning problem um, these days, it's always deep learning, which is the solution to that. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about very high level about deep learning on images, and then we'll get just to this transfer learning bit. Uh, I have this reference right here. This is a class at Stanford CS231. And I just want us to take a look at it to see that, uh, so here's like their syllabus and we're covering everything up to here um, in like 20 minutes. So not super in depth. Uh, and then uh, the very last thing that they build up to transfer learning is, is what we're focusing on. Um, but uh, yeah, lots more detail here that we're not covering. Uh, so the first thing, like what is the performance that people are getting on ImageNet these days? This graph over here shows the performance over time that people's deep learning models are getting on ImageNet. Uh, so AlexNet uh, was sort of the first deep learning model that uh, people used and 63% uh, accuracy here, which uh, 63 sounds like a low number. But again, when you think about like it's a thousand different classes and this is actually getting the like correct one of those classes out of a, out of a thousand choices, that's pretty good. People were pretty uh, astonished at the time when uh, AlexNet did this. Previous to AlexNet, the best uh, scoring things were like on the order of 10%. Um, so a huge jump in performance right here, uh, going to these deep neural networks. <coughs> And then state of the art today is people are getting around 90% accuracy on, uh, on this ImageNet task. 
Um, so people more or less consider the, the ImageNet task to be solved. Uh, you can see that like 2013 to, uh, I don't know, 2018-ish, not a whole lot of neural networks. Each one of these dots is a different paper publishing a different deep learning system. Uh, not a whole lot of those papers coming out. Uh, nowadays, there's tons and tons of, of those papers coming out that, that are using uh, this data set somehow. Um, so yeah, takeaway from that is just that the performance has been going way up over time and it's really good and it's way better than anybody expected it would be uh, 15 years ago. Um, take a look at that here in a second, but I wanna take a look at this picture of AlexNet and relate this picture back to all the stuff that we've been talking about. Uh, so when people talk about deep learning systems, very often draw a picture that looks something like this. Each one of these boxes right here represents uh, one of the layers of the uh, neural network. And in particular, it represents one of those uh, A sub I matrices. Uh, from our previous notes about uh, neural networks, that all of these A matrices are getting um, uh, multiplied together until we get to the final output over here. This very first one right here, that's the input image, uh, that's X. And so this, just this stuff in the dotted uh, blue lines right here, that would be the X A sub I. And then each one of these, uh, between the, the boxes, it's not drawn at all, but it's just implicit that there's some uh, linear or nonlinear uh, activation function like that. So this dashed box right there corresponds to this, uh, that formula. And here there's, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six of these uh, hidden layers. This is our output over here. Six of these hidden layers, so there would be six of these AIs chained together. Um, I'll add a, I should have drawn this farther to the right. So A1, A2, sigma, that in the green box, and that is that green box is equivalent to to this whole thing right here. Uh, so usually the, and then here we have these, uh, these numbers down here. These numbers are the, the size of those uh, hidden layers that uh, we said that uh, is very common to represent the, uh, the hidden layers uh, or we needed the dimensions of the matrix. These are like the representing the dimensions size of the hidden layer. And so this uh, has uh, just six of these uh, boxes, so six hidden layers. Today, this would be considered a not very deep neural network, uh, but at the time, people were only uh, successfully able to train like one and two layer neural networks. And so uh, 2012, this was considered deep. The hidden, hidden units that people are always using uh, for any uh, deep learning application since 2012, uh, the sigma is always that ReLU activation function. And so we have a formula for our uh, VC dimension of the uh, of a network that looks like this. We have bounds on this VC dimension. Where, uh, so it looked like O of K E log K E like that. 
where the K was the number of layers. And this E was the total number of parameters. It turns out that if uh, we worked out all the math here for uh, the total number of parameters, uh, that the E here is approximately like 60 million. And yeah, so the VC dimension of this thing here, uh, very, very large. At the time when AlexNet was first uh, created and proposed, uh, we didn't have any clue about the si about what the VC dimension of AlexNet was. This uh, bound uh, was proved much later. I think the, the specific paper that uh, I referenced in the other notes was 2018 and AlexNet came in 2012. Uh, so this is a, an example where like our theoretical understanding of this machine learning model uh, has uh, lagged quite a bit behind the, the actual practical uh, impl implementations. Any questions about any of that? Okay, so uh, two more comments related to this. The first is that uh, if we compare this VC dimension here, so it's something on the order of like 100 million is our VC dimension. If we compare that to the amount of data points that we have, it seems like we don't have enough data for, like it, the image net problem itself doesn't have enough data for, for this model. So this, um, that, say right here, it's gonna imply that the VC about 100 million, being very generous with rounding factors here, multiplying this thing by six, that K, the number of hidden layers by six. Uh, but either way, it's just a really big number, much bigger, bigger than the number of data points. And, uh, and so it was very, very surprising to people and very confusing at the time about why this a model like this could work. And for our particular task, so we're not using ImageNet, we're using this B task. Uh, and we said that, so we only have like 400 data points and our, our training set's only 245. So our, like our target VC dimension is about 24. Uh, so something like AlexNet is like way, way, way out of the scope for, um, for, for our particular problem. Any questions about that? So yeah, actually plugging in this six times six here would be 36, 360 million. And um, yeah, so this approximate, like, I don't know, make these lines really squiggly. Um, <laughs> That um, yeah, and uh, this is all like in big O notation too. We don't actually know uh, what the constant factors are here. Usually, the constant factors for these sorts of things are very large. Um, so I think this is a pretty generous, like um, maybe a uh, a better here. What I what I'm really meaning when I say this is that the DVC dimension is approximately greater than or equal to. That we know it's we know it's definitely bigger than this thing over here, uh, and we could make it even. We could, if we thought about that more, we could make it maybe a tighter bound. Um, uh, but just the point is that it's absurdly large.
I have this uh, uh, note down here about the ResNet deep residual learning for image recognition here, uh, because in the tutorial, the thing that you'll actually be using is uh, one of the models that came right after AlexNet uh, called ResNet. And I'll just flip over back here again. Um, So yeah, ResNet, nope. They don't have uh, the optimal ResNet. Oh, there we go. Uh, here's uh, ResNet in like 2016 uh, time frame, And um, it's sort of like the, become the standard model that everybody uses for um, like the tutorial uh, sort of purposes. So ResNet's the, the thing that this tutorial uses. If we take a look at this actual paper and come down here, this is how people draw the, the ResNet model. This is the original paper. Each one of these boxes right here represents one of those layers. And uh, each line here is one of those um, sigma functions. And so there's, there's a very, a, a very many layers inside of here. This has 34 layers. The uh, tutorial has you use uh, ResNet 18, uh, but it goes all the way up to ResNet 150 uh, as the number of layers. And again, at the time, nobody knew how to calculate VC dimensions for this. So instead of actually calculating VC dimensions, people put, a, put in the number of parameters for their model, and people still do that today. And the number of parameters being like a, uh, um, somehow an approximation of the VC dimension of the model. Um, so this ResNet 1202 having 20 million parameters inside of it. Uh, and again, eventually we did learn that the VC dimension depends linearly on the number of parameters, but then also on the number of layers. Um, so somehow, again, takeaway at this point, these deep learning systems, the important thing about them is not like, what are they doing under the hood? Not uh, uh, anything like that, that would be way too much uh, to talk about. The, the important thing is they had just have an absurdly high VC dimension. And for our problem, we're not going to be able to work with that. Uh, let's see. So under these theoretical problems, I didn't mention this yet. So highly non-convex optimization. Um, we already talked about the neural network not being convex, but this is uh, extra deep, so it's extra non-convex. So that implies that uh, we can't guarantee that we get a global optimum. But for some reason, which is still unknown today, um, when people are training these ResNet models, AlexNet, uh, the, the local optima they get, is always a really good one. Um, so yeah, there's some I don't know, very major open problem in machine learning right now, figuring out why that's the case. So, so um, just going back to the part about like how we were able to like, get something that worked with such a high VC dimension, like, like is that would that be considered open to because we don't really understand based on that bound how it would be like actually yeah, so this it is also an open problem. I have that listed uh, next down here. Um, so statistical um, that we have these very high VC dimensions, uh, but somehow we're still getting uh, very good results. And it is an open problem. Um, it's not the sort of open problem that would appear on like a true false open. Uh, midterm exam, though, because uh, formally stating exactly what the open problem is, is kind of obnoxious. Uh, but, uh, but here I'm going to draw a picture right here, which uh, is going to articulate exactly what the, the nature of this open problem is. That here, so we've, we've drawn pictures like this before, where we have model complexity on the uh, the x-axis down here. And we've had a bunch of different things that we've talked about for model complexity, the main one being the VC dimension. 
but also the like the various L2, L1 regularizations, and also the uh, the M, the the number of elements in our hypothesis class. And we always had uh, the case where as the model complexity um, increases, our training error. Whoops, it doesn't go below zero. Let me draw that. That's our E sub n, and then our E n minus E out. This is just our, our classic graph right here, and our E out like that. But it turns out, and then, yeah, it's also add that over here, do this in orange. To the left, this is underfitting. And to the right over here, this is overfit. Uh, it turns out that in practice, for some reason that we don't actually know, if you make the, uh, the model complexity absurdly large, that this trend starts reversing and our EN minus out starts going down. So this green is also EN minus E out. The red over here is what's predicted by VC theory. And the green over here is what's observed in practice. In deep learning. And this phase over here, when you're in uh, the regime where the, the, the generalization error starts going down, this over here is called the double descent phase. And again, nobody has a good theoretical explanation about why this happens. Um, we just observe that, that it does happen. And um, uh, yeah. Question? So, is this like exclusive to deep learning or? Question is, is it exclusive to deep learning? The answer is it's actually not. It's uh, what it turns out to be is it's a property of stochastic gradient descent that anything learned with stochastic gradient descent is going to have this uh, property right here. And um, so people have observed it in uh, ensembles. They've observed it in, um, in every, every possible model that can be trained with stochastic gradient descent. And uh, what, um, yeah, so technically what VC theory says is that this, is, this bound is going to hold for all possible distributions. And there ex exists some distribution of data for which the bound is tight. Uh, in practice, though, we always have like somehow nice distributions, like images have some, we can't describe what the distribution is, but it's a very reasonably nice distribution. It's not just like static noise. And somehow that's related to this double descent region. Uh, properly taking advantage of all that, though, is uh, really difficult. And both beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about and beyond the scope of what anybody actually does in practice. The only things that the only people who deal with this double descent region in practice are the um, uh, re researchers in deep learning, uh, whether in academia or at uh, like fame companies. Uh, but in practice, people who are working on real world problems, they will do what we're going to see next, do this transfer learning setup where uh, we'll start with a model that somebody else has already trained on ImageNet and uh, use that to generate good features for us and stay in this classical regime over here. Uh, so is that a question? Never actually take advantage of those like those sort of plans in the real world. Well, I guess uh, upper bound is 10,000 people exist who, who care about this regime. Um, those are the people who are like um, uh, deep learning uh, professors or um, people working at like Google Brain developing new deep learning algorithms. Um, but somebody who is developing like a, just a random new image classification 
system uh, is not going to be doing large scale like data sets like this, um, having smaller data sets like this, and uh, staying in the in the classical regime. Uh, but this is yeah, this is sort of like where all of the interesting theoretical work in machine learning is happening right now is understanding double descent and the deep learning stuff. But the practical work that's happening is, um, is this transfer learning thing that we'll talk about next. So the idea of uh, transfer learning, so tricks, we're gonna use three different tricks for our particular data set here in order to be able to use one of these ResNet models to actually train uh, something on our very, very small data set. Uh, the main one of those tricks here is uh, transfer learning. So this first trick here, use an ImageNet trained CNN for feature extraction. If I scroll back up to this plot up here, all of these um, weights, so each one of these boxes here represents a weight matrix or weight vector or weight tensor um, for each one of these layers. And when AlexNet was originally being trained on ImageNet, all of these weights were being trained along with it. The trick of transfer learning is that we're not going to train all those weights anymore. We're only going to train the very last set of weights in the outputs. And if we do that, we can we will drastically reduce the uh, the number of uh, uh, the VC dimension of our problem. Uh, it turns out that uh, we'll, one way to think about this is that this right here that outputs a vector, and for each image, we're just going to run AlexNet or ResNet or any of these models on our image to get one of these vectors. And that vector is now our, um, our, our training sample. Outputs a vector, which will be the new X sub I. So the new training sample. And so the idea here, it's called transfer learning because somehow when we were training this model, all training all the A sub I's, on ImageNet, we were getting good features for images, uh, presumably. If we were getting good results on ImageNet, then we were getting good features here. Um, so training all the A sub I on ImageNet implies good image features. And in particular, people generally assume that the E out on ImageNet will be approximately equal to the E in on your problem. That might not be the case because it might be the case that like ImageNet just doesn't contain Bs or doesn't contain ants, or it might be that the human annotators for those particular labels uh, did a particularly poor job. Um, so it's a very approximate sort of thing, but that's, that's our hope. This is what we hope to have happen. And in practice, it um, pretty much always works out to be uh, basically like this. But now since we're only training the last layer, This will be equivalent to uh, logistic regression. And so the VC dimension will be relatively small, linear. And in particular, the, it'll be the same as the output number of features from whatever deep learning system we're using.
that varies from um, uh, model to model, but it's basically always in the range of like 1024 to 4096. I think uh, uh, the AlexNet uh, was 4096. If we look above, it has the number and uh, the ResNets are, are 1024. Uh, so it's still higher than what our data set is maybe exactly calling for, um, but this is much, much closer, much more reasonable than, um, than training the whole model. Let's see. I want to skip over those computational notes right now and just jump over here to this other solution number two, this data set augmentation. And uh, this is going to be the, the other main statistical trick that's super important for us. And so uh, oh, I don't have the, the link anymore. That's unfortunate. Oh, but I can click it. Uh, one of the things that the, 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 the documentation, the, the tutorial spends quite a lot of time on is talking about this uh, data augmentation. And I just want to show some pictures of what that looks like here. That if we have a cat image like this, that uh, all of these images right here are still obviously cats. That if you just flip the, the image vertically, horizontally, rotate it a little bit, they're still obviously cats, but they're different uh, image uh, inputs now. And so we can get more data using uh, these random horizontal flips or random vertical flips. Um, here, they're doing random cropping, zooming in on a cat. It's maybe not necessarily obvious anymore that this thing right here is a cat if you didn't know that it came from uh, the original image, but all these other things still sort of look like cats. Changing the colors, uh, changing, yeah, lots of weird different transformations like this. And you combine that all together and you can make your original data set that was only uh, 200 data points into something that's uh, 2,000 or 20,000 data points. And they're no longer IID data points. They're no longer independent of each other, but in practice, they're like uh, close to being independent. And, uh, and so now we do have enough data points for, uh, for a VC dimension of this size. Um, I think that's a good stopping point for us for today. There's some other small issues for us to talk about, but at this point you could get started on the assignment if you wanted. And it's due not this coming Sunday, but the Sunday after that. Again, if anybody has questions about this or midterm grading, happy to chat after class about that. Thank you.